Uh, hello, this is Miguel Trujillo. How are you doing? How's everybody doing today? I might look a little bit different than normal today and that is because I am wearing glasses. You may not know that I wear glasses, but I do. And uh, I've been, in fact, I've been wearing glasses ever since I was a uh, junior in high school. And in fact, wearing contacts is uh, something that's rather new to me. I only started wearing contacts maybe five years ago, if that. And uh, I tell you, I really do love wearing contacts. I love them compared to glasses. I, I'm not a really big fan of wearing glasses anymore. So I was quickly converted to wearing contacts. Um, but I was thinking today, I ran across an interesting article in a journal uh, related to the coronavirus. And it was uh, some study that was done in, I think it was done in China. And they did a survey of the people in the ICU there who had corona and what percentage of them were, wore glasses and which ones didn't. And they came up with some interesting conclusions. One conclusion, one interesting observation, rather, is that only about 5% of the people in the ICU, that is 5%, uh, wore glasses compared to oh, uh, what they would expect. And that is that about 30% of people in that particular locale uh, wore glasses routinely in uh, society, in the general public. And anyway, I started pondering or thinking about that. I think the, the paper began, suggested the idea that people who wear glasses tend to touch their eyeballs less. And uh, I thought, hey, that makes some sense. I appreciated that. And I said, oh, well. You know, I'm not necessarily keen on touching my eyeballs <laughs> twice a day, you know, to take out my contacts and to put in my contacts at the end of the, at the beginning and end of the day. But uh, I figured, hey, that's an easy thing for me to do. I'll just wear glasses for the next six weeks. <laughs> no big deal. And so I think, I think I'm going to go through with it. I'm going to wear some of my glasses for a while. Who knows? Maybe it'll provide me just a smidge of protection against this virus. Who knows if I'll get it or not. But anyway, I figured, hey, maybe that's a precaution that I could use. It's actually it's not really something that I could do that's really easy and makes sense. So maybe I'll do it. So I think I'm going to do it. Yay! Yay for me. Changing behavior. You know, that's what live living is all about. It's about small behavior changes day after day after day you know making one percent improvement uh, of your behavior every day can mean the difference a huge difference in the end so i'm sort of an advocate of that i'm always looking to change my behaviors in ways that can help me be successful in the world and so hey well you know sometimes you know it's the small things that helped the most. Anyway, I'm at, I, today I was admiring myself with my glasses, and <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how it goes. I think there's one consideration, and that is I talk here at this uh, on this on these videos about my, my working out. It's gonna be interesting to see how I end up wearing my glasses. Oh, I want to talk about another subject. <laughs> I picked up a pretty neat app for recording my sets and reps, weights and exercises. Uh, I, th I think it's called Strong, this app called Strong, and I'm really liking it. Now, yesterday was chest, and uh, I, I only started using the app in the last two exercises, which was an inclined bench press machine and a, and a, like a horizontal bench press machine. And so, uh, it worked out really well. I'm really impressed with the software and I'm excited to use it tomorrow. So 
that's actually something I have to remember to do. So there's another aspect of me changing my behavior. I'm actually pretty excited about this because, see, I've been using my smartphone to um, record uh, my workouts using Google Keep. Now, I love Google Keep. It's a great program, but it, you know, it's not perfect. For me, I think of it, it, I use it pretty much like a text editor. And uh, it's been working in that well in that capacity. So I'm a little bit excited to uh, move on to something a little bit more sophisticated. And from the brief introduction that I had yesterday, or earlier this morning, um, I'm pretty excited. I think it's going to make a big difference in me getting more data about my lifts. And what's great about data when weightlifting is, you know, now I know people who uh, are weightlifters and they don't take any notes at all. And that's perfectly okay. I've seen very successful people lift weights, make changes to their physique, and not really need to write anything down. Now I, on the other hand, love to take notes. I am a data fiend. I love data. I love crunching that data. I want that data be, to be there. And so for a data head like me, this is a big deal. And, uh, and I'm always looking for ways for me to get more and better data, particularly ways that are easy for me to implement and are natural. And so anyway, I'm pretty happy about this. It's kind of funny. Let's see. I started out, when I first started weightlifting, I, uh, I started to uh, use uh, pen and paper. And, and uh, that worked pretty well. But, um, but it had its limitations. Particularly when I forgot the pen and paper. Or maybe I couldn't find a pen. And anyway, so I started using smartphones, and uh, <laughs> I started using my smartphone, and it's been really nice. I've been really pleased by the results, and uh, so I'm really excited about that. Now, now of course, I was using my smartphone as just a regular text editor, so using an app, I think, it's going to help me crunch the numbers. You know, I'm, I've been sort of focused in on this idea about physique change. You know, what is it can I change about my body? And what is it can I, can I, can, can I not change? And uh, what I'm finding is that, you know, there are certain limitations that I have in terms of my control. Um, but I'm really, I mean, after 50, nearly 50 years of living in my body, or actually, it's been over 50 years <laughs> now that I think about it. At least in terms of me living in my body, um, I am making really good progress in terms of diet and exercise, and I'm feeling more confident than I've ever felt before in um, taking control over my body uh, by uh, keeping myself at the body weight that I want to be at, and um, also, uh, thinking uh, the thoughts that I want to think, that I decide to think, and uh, it, it, it's funny. It gets kind of interesting. You know, I do have. I wouldn't consider myself a control freak necessarily. In fact, I'm very much quite the opposite. I let. I quite often I let the ball roll where it may. It's particularly, in many respects, uh, regarding my external environment. And I think part of the reason has to do with um, my enthusiasm or beliefs related to stoicism where you know, I'm very cognizant of all the things that I can control and the things that I can't. And I'm quite aware that most of the time if I want to seek to have control over anything, it's typically going to be um, whatever it is that's whatever the content or material is in my mind. But at least I have some modicum of control. Now, I don't have perfect control over it, certainly. But I have some control over my mind, some very limited control over my body. 
I do have control over my behavior. Quite often, I will reflect on my hands and their dexterity, and my legs and arms, their dexterity, certainly my mouth and tongue and throat and its ability to produce sounds. And, uh, you know, it's reminders like this that let me know where my control is. I actually very, very have very little control over my external environment. I could certainly influence my environment a little bit. But it also, not only recognizing that I don't have control over my external environment is really important because it also lets me know about where it makes sense for me to get emotionally invested. <laughs> you know, fact is, things in my external environment I have very little control over, and so it doesn't, it really doesn't make sense for me to get invested, emotionally invested in those things. And so, you know, it helps me keep my, keep my uh, keel, my emotional keel, nice and steady as I uh, progress through my life. In fact, recently I downloaded an audiobook called Woulda, Coulda, Shoulda, because I am quite curious right now about thinking better about that th that kind of thinking. <laughs> I think if you uh, pay attention to rational emotive behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, while having some um, sort of uh, focus on the past and history or, or what the future might be, uh, or even what the present isn't, but could be, <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's powerful to sort of understand the world in that way, but uh, it's very easy to sort of indulge a little bit too much in thinking about how things could be, or how things should be, or what might have been. It's just this whole what if. You know, using what if scenarios is uh, important. And when it comes to planning and risk reduction and uh, lots of things, but it's quite easy to overindulge. And I think human beings have a tendency to overindulge in what ifing because we just want things to be better. <laughs> you know? Or we, I should say, we want things to be different quite often. <laughs> human beings, or at least our culture, is that way. And there's less a focus on acceptance than maybe there ought to be. So anyway, I think lately I've been recognizing the distinction between, say, woulda, coulda, shoulda thinking and acceptance of what is. Now, accepting what is, I always like to say that accepting what is doesn't necessarily imply that you want things to stay the way that they are. But, um, Accepting what is is sort of a shortcut to prevent yourself from uh, um, you know accepting what is is kind of a shortcut to uh, enlightenment in some respects uh, anyway wow look at this house behind me it's got quite an amazing array of wonderful Christmas lights speaking of Christmas I'm going to change the subject again this is after all my video blog I just wanted to mention how much I'm enjoying the Christmas season. I am going to do my best to engage in as many Christmas traditions as I possibly can out of the sheer joy of performing them. <laughs> uh, yesterday, my uh, beloved girlfriend um, bought a... Uh, a uh, little twig of uh, the uh, what is it uh, the mistle mistletoe plant and I'm excited about uh, getting that mistletoe working for us uh, you know getting a string and uh, putting it above the arch of a, of a doorway looking definitely looking forward to that I've been entertaining the idea of possibly um, leaving cookies and milk for Santa <laughs> the night of Christmas Eve. I mean, come on, that is a blast. That's a blast and a half. If you if you ask me, I mean, all the, really, what it means is I get to eat cookies in the morning. 
<laughs> after I microwave it. Uh, for good measure, because who doesn't like warm, gooey chocolate chip cookies, you know? Anyway, um, let's see. What else is going on? Well, anyway, I, I just want to, I've also been thinking about the winter time. You know, winter is upon us nearly. It's, uh, what, the 7th of December, and winter begins the 21st of December, which I think uh, is the winter solstice. It's my daughter's half birthday. And uh, I can, I'm just really looking forward to this winter. Why, you might ask? Well, first of all, there's a lot of good reasons to look forward to winter. Number one, I think, is because winter is beautiful. Winter is one of the most beautiful seasons there is. And there's another thing that I like about winter, <laughs> and that is that winter is, not only is it beautiful, but it's got wonderful smells. You know, the smells of chimneys, chimneys uh, uh, keeping, uh, homes warm, you know, that's that smoke, that wood burning fireplaces. Come on, that's a lot of good stuff right there. And not only that, but also um, besides the beauty and the cells, of the sense, there's also this thing that I really like, which is just the sense of being cozy. You know, because it's a little chillier, people are at home, they're drinking their hot cocoa. They're making their soups and stews. Uh, you know, uh, everyone is preparing foods that are really warming. And hey, I love those kind of foods. I love that kind of, I love all the things that help make our lives more cozy. Whether it's blankets, like electric blankets, or big fuzzy socks, or hats and gloves and jackets. Oh, by the way, the fashion fashion is really great during the winter time too because it gives you a chance to layer clothes and if anyone knows anything about fashion the layered look is very appealing you know it's sort of a mix match sort of like a uh, just a I don't know I just think that layers you get layers in clothing look nice and let me tell you there's also something about people wearing jackets you know Jackets are just nice looking. Quite often people have got these three-quarter trench coats or these pea coats. They've got beautiful sweaters. It's long sleeve sweaters. they got turtlenecks. Um, I don't know. There's just something about winter clothing that's really appealing. It's a chance to wear things like boots. And uh, now in, in California, while it might get chilly, it doesn't get super cold because it doesn't snow where I live. Not really, although it has snowed like once or twice in the period of time that I've been here, but it's only been like things like hailstorms. You know, an hour later, you don't really notice that anything has happened because the hail has melted. The same is true with snow. I've seen dusting of snow when, you know, by midday it's all gone. That's actually something that's quite typical around here. So, anyway, I'm really. I really appreciate the the warmth, and so it doesn't get cold so so much that everyone's wearing these parkas and fur-lined parkas and flea, big old fleece jackets and things like that. But that's okay because winter clothing is very stylish, and so I look back, I look forward to some of the fashion aspects of it. One thing I also like about winter is that. I'm discovering that uh, the drier air in wintertime means that I snore less. <laughs> For some reason, I'm noticing that there's a connection between me snoring at night and humidity in the air. Very low humidity means that I snore less. High humidity means that I snore more. At least that is the supposition I have. and I'll, I'll be delving more into that uh, in the future. But uh, anyway just wanted to pass along some of these ideas about why I like winter so much and I guess I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.